meeting at the FOL in Manchester. By the way, Joshua sent his greetings. He was proudly on the set of drums. He was the FOL band leader and the, and the drummer. He was just having fun. He had a good time. But he says he'll be back soon. Amen. It was a really, really good celebration in Manchester yesterday. The whole place was packed full. And I was, I was really happy that I went. But I also heard that the vigil here was powerful. Excellent. I know some people don't pray at night. That's why they didn't come to vigil. But the Bible says that we should, even in the house of God, we should be awake all night and not give him rest. Amen? On my way back from Manchester, I heard God spoke to me on the train that I should share something along the line of something that I heard at the FOL. And I, I set my mind I was going to prepare to just share it. And guess what? To sound as if it was going to check whether I had made up my mind to share it or not, Pastor Tony yeah. and GMK, on their way back from a meeting they went yesterday morning, picked me up at Houston Station, and as we were going, we started talking. And I didn't know what we were discussing. And I told them, oh, God said I should, I feel God said I should preach about this tomorrow. And I told them the title of my message. And I heard in my heart, so you now need to preach it, isn't it? You've said it. Okay. So I got home and I, I mean, of course, over the, over the night, I, I got myself prepared. But this morning, for me, there are different ways that you can pick that God is speaking to you. One of the ways for me was that as I woke up this morning, there's a, there's a, there's a, a scriptural, a pastoral scriptural program that I have on my system that gives me one passage of the scripture every single day to just read is a whole passage of the scripture that just comes to, I mean, just flash on my screen as I open it. And normally, apart from my usual um, um, devotional um, reading, I read that as well. Guess what? As I open my iPad, the passage that I was going to use for the message was exactly what flashed on my screen. So I thought, okay, I'm going to just do exactly what God wants me to do. This morning, I want to share with us something that it might make some of you uncomfortable. In fact, I dare say that after we are finished, and we're going to, not going to spend a lot of time, we're going to do a lot of reading of the Bible and you will be able to understand just from reading that God is speaking to you. Because I believe we are at the same at the time when God is desperate for his people to be awakened to do what he wants to do. Say to somebody beside you, I'm happy I'm in church today. You need to be happy. You are here anyway. But let's start this way. How many of you have been on holidays before? You've gone on holiday to somewhere. Yeah? How many of you, in, you are on holidays to London? How many of you are on holiday now? Okay, okay, good. Fantastic. Or you've been to go and stay somewhere with someone. Just have a weekend break. When you go there, even if for a few days, because you are not there for too long, how many of you remember how you didn't really unpack your bag? You just found somewhere nice in the room to just put your suitcase. So you unpacked, but you didn't really unpack. Most of the time, you find a way, maybe even on the bed sometimes, 
So you just, just to create a space for you, you put the suitcase there and then you just lie down somewhere and you sleep like that all through the holiday. Inconveniencing yourself and not really unpacking. When you need anything, where do you go? You go to the suitcase. When you need to brush your teeth in the morning, on the next day, you go there, took your toothbrush and your toothpaste, go to the bathroom and do your wash. When you finish that, you want to dress up, you start picking everything from that. And that is how you ended up in a continuous sequence of unpacking for the whole period that you were there. But that is unlike somebody else who got there and fully unpack. In fact, if they came to visit you, you wonder, ah, you're only, there for, you're only here for two days. You have, uh -uh, you're, you have taken over everywhere. <laughs> I mean, someone like that, they just, when they go there, they settle. If it was one day, for that one day, you know what? They settle. If it was two weeks, for that two weeks, they settle. The two ways, a lifestyle, they have their advantages depending on whichever one works for you. I'm not going to knock any one of them. Because it's all about lifestyle. On the other hand, today I want to highlight and spell out briefly one major disadvantage of the two. And then that will create a foundation for what I want to share with us today. If you fully unpack your bag or your suitcase, apart from using more space, Sometimes, more than you have been allowed, more than you, they have envisaged that you're going to use, you go to their bathroom. I mean, you spread everything that you came with. Even the people that own the bathroom, they're wondering, ah-ah. Uh -uh. They are checking. You are likely to use more space than you are, that you are supposed to use. But more other than that, you are also needed to, you are going to also need to spend a little more time to unpack the bag when you get there. Because it took you time to pack before you came. So when you got there, you have to separate a time to unpack and put things where you are going to need to use them. And that could be, as it were, a challenge for some of us because you don't really know how you are going to really have time to do all those things. But that, that could be, as it were, a downside and a disadvantage to fully unpack it because you just want to get on and just start to enjoy yourself on your holiday. But on the other hand, for the person who never really unpack, What you found out is that if you don't unpack, by the time you are going back, heading back, you are likely to find out in your suitcase that half of the things you brought, you never used them. Because you didn't even remember they were there. Because you were living according to your mindset and your need of the moment. It is when you need something, you go there. If you don't need it, you don't, you don't bother yourself. And for us, because you live like that, you find out that it is because, like I said, out of sight is out of mind. You put it there, but because you don't see it, if you have unpacked it and put it where you can see it, you are likely to use it. But if you don't unpack it, you didn't even remember that it was there because as your need arises, you just carry through what you need. But don't forget we're human beings. Human beings, we have a way of easily falling into a routine 
and we get stuck in that routine. You could go on holiday and find out that you actually live as though you were at home. Because it is the same thing you've been doing for the past 10 years that you still do on that holiday because that is your way of life. When you wake up, what you do first? Then after you, but on holiday, you need to unwind, isn't it? You need to just do something different. But that does not happen because you did not unpack. If care is not taken, you find out that you are sucked in and the entire of the time that you spend away from home is as though as you are at home. Let's read a passage of the Bible that God sent to his children that were in captivity somewhere in Babylon. He sent a message to them and let's read how that message is spelled out in the Bible. We'll read from Jeremiah 29 from verse 1 to 7. Jeremiah 29 from verse 1 to 7 and we, we might extend it later on to 14. I'm going to read from the contemporary English version because it's just very simple, very simple, simply written there. He said, I have been left. This is Jeremiah speaking. He said, I have been left in Jerusalem when King Nebuchadnezzar took many of the people of Jerusalem and Judah to Babylonia as prisoners including King Joachim, his mother, his officials, and the metal workers, and others in Jerusalem who were skilled in making things. Jeremiah here was spelling out that there was a raid on Jerusalem by a foreign king from Babylon and he took away not just the subjects of Jerusalem he took the kings in Jerusalem he took the mother of the king he took all his officials he also took the professionals in the land those who are gifted with working with iron. I guess quite a few of them are engineers. Civil and mechanical. Some are electrical. They were all in the trade. They were all taken as prisoners to Babylon. And I say, so I wrote a letter to the priests, the prophets, the leaders, and the rest of our people in Babylonia. I gave the letter to Elasa and Gemaria, two men that King Zedekiah of Judah was sending to Babylon to talk with Nebuchadnezzar. So he gave them a letter because they were going there anyway to hand it over for the people. In the letter... I wrote that the Lord all-powerful, the God of Israel, had said, I had, I had you taken from Jerusalem to Babylonia. Who took them? Who allowed for them to be taken to Babylon? It was God. Take note of that. It says, now I tell you, to settle there and build houses, plant gardens, and eat what they grow in them. Get married, have children, then help your sons find wives, 
help your daughters find husbands so they can have children as well. I want your, mem your numbers to grow, not to get smaller. Pray for peace in Babylonia and work hard to make it prosperous. The most successful that nation is, the better off you will be. Amen? Everywhere that there is written there, Babylon, put the United Kingdom. I'm sharing with us today a message of passion that I believe that God is beginning to ring from heaven because if there's anything that God is determined to see happen in the United Kingdom is that the United Kingdom will become a country and a nation of saints for God again. It's not a prayer. It's a statement of fact. God wants the United Kingdom to become a nation that worship God of heaven again. We've been talking about a revival for a long time. The revival is now about to be unleashed. Not because you and I want to, but because God is determined to get it to happen. I know how he's going to do it. He's going to start with you and I. How many of you travel from far to the United Kingdom? You are not from the United Kingdom. How many? Quite a few. I'm not saying your nationality, your citizenship. Where you came from originally. Where your seed came from. How many of us? Okay, how many are British here? You're British. You look British. Amen? Yo, uh, of, co of course, Andre is British. Every single one of us, apart from Andrea and John, Joseph, beg your pardon, this message is talking to you. The reason that God allowed us to come to the other kingdom. Some of us are kings where we came from. You are like Jehoiakim. You have a kingly anointing. Some of us are queen's mother and king's mother. Some of us are qualified to be in the cabinet of our various nations. The well read. Some of us will have been good politicians in our various countries from Kenya, from Ghana, from Congo, from Nigeria, from wherever it is you came from. You will have done well being in government with the way that you have studied. Of course, some of us are professionals and we will have been good professionals running our own companies and businesses from where we came from. Engineers. We will have done well profiting from our career. But God said, I am the one who allowed you to come over here for a purpose. However, when we got there, what did we start to do? It's not me. 
But let's read what they were doing in Babylon. Why God needed to send this message to them. Let's go to Psalm 137 from verse 1. Psalm 137 from verse 1. It says, Beside the river of Babylon, we thought about Jerusalem. And we sat down and cried. We hung our small harps on the willow tree. Our enemies had brought us here as prisoners. Now they wanted us to sing and entertain them. They insulted us and shouted, Sing about Zion. Here in a foreign land, how can we sing about the Lord? They were in Babylon throwing a pity party for themselves. They were in Babylon thinking about home. They were in Babylon feeling sorry for why their host country took them captive. God said, these people, I need to send a message for them. They sat down, not just sitting down, they were there crying. What were they crying about? They were crying and said, our enemies had brought us here as prisoners. They did not realize that it was God who orchestrated for that to happen. We didn't come, a lot of us didn't come here as prisoners. We came here for so many reasons. Some for economic reasons. Some for academic reasons. Some because of marriage. Some because of leisure. Some because of professional, whatever it is that you're doing. God arranged it. The same way that he said, I am the one who allowed you to be taken captive to Babylon. God is the one who arranged it that you came. When we got here, we started to think about home. Is it interesting? Most of the time, those who are here are thinking about home. Those who are at home are thinking about out. And God is saying, I need to get something right here. Because it is pivotal. There is always a reason why God do something. Why was it that he allowed them to be taken captive to Babylon? He said to them in that message, he said, you guys, I want you to settle. Take ownership of the land. Not just take ownership of the land, he says, settle there and build houses. Plant gardens. There are not a lot of farmers here. But he was saying to them, start businesses. Establish businesses. Don't just live from hand to mouth. Don't continue to feel so sorry for yourself. Don't call it to feel as though you don't have anything that you can live on. Remember that you are kings. Queen, king's mother. You are official. You are also professionals. People who are skilled in a lot of metal work. He says, 
plant in those gardens. Don't just plant there. He says, you should also eat what you sow and grow in those gardens. Get married. Get your children to also get married. And let them have children or themselves. Say beyond that, pray for the peace of Babylon. Pray for the peace of United Kingdom. He says, don't just pray, work hard to make it prosper. And there's a reason for that. He says, pray to make it prosper. The most successful that nation is the better off you will be. If you marry the two together, the message that God sent to them and the way that they were living in Babylon and they in contrast to themselves. They got to Babylon and was living as though they were in bondage. But God said, no, you are not in bondage. Free yourself. The title of this message, if you're going to give it a title, is Unpack the Suitcases. Unpack the suitcases. Say to your neighbor, unpack your suitcase. Where you have those suitcases and you are going there to go and pick things, please go there and unpack it. Everything you had there. I mean, don't you imagine when you are going on holidays, because if you are so like me, when you want to go on holiday, you are thinking about all the things you are going to do on the holidays, and you are picking things that will be useful. If you are going to go swimming, you pick your swimming trunk. If you don't have one, you get one and put it in the, in the suitcase. When you get there, because you don't swim every day, you won't even remember you had a swimming trunk. You won't even remember. On the last day, you now drove past, ah, so there's a swimming pool here. It was no, of, of no use to you. Why? Because you didn't unpack that suitcase. Rather than making a living out of the suitcase, unpack them and have a good eye view, a good horizon of the potentials that are open to you. When you don't open up the suitcase and unpack it, there are so many things that are hidden there that you won't even remember they are there. The same way, if you are here as an individual, I don't know whether you can hear the cry of the heart of God. God wants United Kingdom to become a nation of prophets and priests once again. The same situation that they were in before they brought the gospel to the other part of the world. We ought to be forever grateful to this nation for how they served God. For how they gave themselves to serve and make themselves to be used by God. I was sharing about this a few weeks ago and I said a lot of them when they were living in the kingdom they gave everything they had away to people. They decided when they sang, you know when we sing the song I have decided to follow Jesus. How many of you sing that song? You, lo you love singing it? Okay, let's sing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. How are you following Jesus? When those first saints... Before the world war, 
in the 1800s, in the 1700s, when they were leaving United Kingdom to go to Africa, to go to Asia, to go to every one of these foreign land, when they were singing that song, they were singing it saying bye-bye to their background. They were giving up everything that they had. Some of them sold it. Some of them gave it to people who were around them. Some of them told their families, I'm going, if I don't come back again, we will meet at the feet of Christ. Isn't it true that a lot of them died where they went to? How many of you went to a school that was started by one of those missionaries? How many of you went to one? Pastor, where did you go? St. Thomas. Where did you go? Maryland. Reagan. St. Anne's. Our Lady of Apostle. Which one? Where? Pardon? St. James. Where? Who else went to one? St. Catherine. All of these schools were started by people who sang that song. Here across this shore. But then when they left this shore, they were following Jesus doing good to people that needed it. That was why a lot of us became kings. We got to school. Because before they came, there was no school. Anytime you see Andrea here, we should be saying thank you and thank you to those that you came from. Those that you are tailored from. Because if not for the goodness and the kindness of this nation for us, you could have been lost. Re Imagine when they got to all those places in Asia, in Africa, West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, decided to think about Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria or the other kings and think about Westminster and think about their land. They wouldn't have done anything. They will have stayed there. They will have died there. In fact, there is one. Those who came from, those who are from Nigeria, there's a city called Ibadan. There was one of the missionaries that was called Papa Padre. Papa Padre was living, was a missionary living at the top of the hill establishing and teaching people how to serve God, how to live for God. People call him the man that lives on top of the hill. Instead of calling him Padre, they call him Paddy. So, till today, that place is still named after him. Those were the landmarks of missionaries. You have been in the United Kingdom. You've been studying. You've been working. You've been living. What is your landmark? When you go back, eventually, because we're going back eventually. For them, the message said, you are going to be there for 70 years. And in the 70 years, you are supposed to live there and settle there and take ownership of the place and build up yourself. When they are going back, they did not go back as people who didn't have anything. They went back as people with treasures. What is it that you are living for? What is it that God could say to you and to me that we are making of our opportunities 
to serve him in the shore of this country. It is not about just going to work and coming back from work. It is about the plan that God has for this land. Because that is why we are here, brothers and sisters. What we need to realize is that it is in doing this that our purpose and lives are fulfilled. Because it says, don't just pray for the land. It says, work hard for its prosperity. Because the more the country that you are in prospers, that is what would determine your own prosperity. So your prosperity doesn't depend on how smart you are. It is how much you can make the country prosper. A lot of us, and I'm saying this, I'm say, what I said earlier on is that it's going to make some of us feel uncomfortable. We're going to unpack this passage, these two passages, more in the next one or two weeks. But why I'm sharing this with us is that it is time for us to be here. So many people are here, but they are not here. They are like those guys seated by the rivers of Babylon. You know that, that song? Somebody sang with it. Is it Bonnie M, is it? Say, by the rivers of Babylon. Ah! I just remember home, oh, man. Home is sweet. But there's a work to be done. There is an agenda on the heart of God that God wants us to take as our own duty. What will not make us to sleep? Because he's not sleeping. I sh I'm sharing this because there is a game change all across. I shared this briefly with the, with the ministers yesterday and the, the HODs and some of the departments. The game plan has changed. Either you like it now or not. God wants us as a church to focus on him using us to bring revival to this nation. I know why. We must adopt it and take it as our nation. I say to people around me, and I say to my children, I said, you are, yes, we're from Africa. You're from Nigeria. But you are here, and I want you to live as though you are here. A lot of us are living as though we are in Africa still. Or we are from the Caribbean still. We need to try and change and adapt our mentality to fit here. So that we can get open up to the treasures of the land. A lot of things are eluding us because we are not opened to it. Because we are not focusing on it. We are not yet seeing it as though we are beneficiaries of it. And God is awakening us that what you are asking for, what you are looking for, they are already there for you. If I go to Nigeria, that's where I come from. I say to people, I am traveling abroad. I don't say I'm going home. Do you know why? Everything about me is here. Where you are calling home, you don't even have a house there. If you go there today, you're going to stay in your parents' house. You're going to stay with a friend. All the money you are going to spend there, they are here. 
you are taking money there. If you run out of money there, you're on your own. Anything you need to do, you need to contact here. Everything about you, your investment is where? Here. So why are you calling that place home? Where is home? Here. This is home. So when you're going there, you're going abroad. That will help us to change our mentality. Because those guys, they were living in Babylon as though they were in Jerusalem. God said, I need to change this mindset. Because they are losing the opportunities of why I took them there. When the time comes for them, let's read the other part. And I'm just going to close. From verse, from verse 8. It says, from verse 8, say, some of your people there in Babylon are fortune tellers. And you have asked them to tell you what will happen in the future. But they will only lead you astray with their dreams. And don't tell you the prophets, the, and don't tell you, and don't let you, the prophet, fool you either. He says, they speak in my name, but they are liars. I have not spoken to them after Babylonia has been in the strongest nation for 70 years. I will be kind and bring you back to Jerusalem. God says, you are there for 70 years. After 70 years, when Babylon is ruled, you've made Babylon great. He says, I will bring you back to Jerusalem. Just as I have promised. I will bless you with a future filled with hope. God is saying to you that you are in this to be blessed. He is going to be the one that will bless you massively. He says, he will not only fill you with hope, he says, it will be a future of success, not suffering. You will turn back to me and ask for help and I will answer your prayers. You will worship me with all your heart and I will be with you and accept your worship. Then I will gather you from all the nations where I scattered you. And you will return to Jerusalem. God says, I will ensure it. I'm the one that allowed you to be taken. I will ensure that you are brought back also. When you're coming back with hope, with success, and with prosperity. This is enough for us. As sons and daughters of God. To make up in our minds. That we're going to live for God. That we are going to take God by his promises. I'm sharing this because a lot of people, I speak to them and they are not really living here. You know what they say? I don't like the food here. I don't like it. It doesn't taste well. You know what? You are supposed to eat it. You know what God said? He says, plant gardens and eat what you grow in the garden. What that means is that there are some food that you can plant in Babylon that you cannot plant in Jerusalem. He says, when you get there, you plant what they plant there and eat it. When I came here, I never used to drink tea. I can tell you how many times I've drank tea in the whole of my life before I came to the United Kingdom. Maybe no more than five times. I didn't just like tea. I didn't like it, Jack. But when I got here, I found out that if you want to talk to people, if you want to have a discussion, hold a cup of tea. A copper will sort you out. 
once you have a cup of tea. But I, did, I was not wise in the early days. When I get there, I said, like a cup of tea? I said, no, 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 I'll just have water. I, I always notice what happens. The discussion didn't really flow. It was the tea. It was the tea. As long as you hold a cup of tea, what you are saying to them is that we are on the same level. They sip it, you also sip it. It just makes you have fun. Even if you don't say anything, just be sipping the tea and be nodding. The job you are going on. It's nice. Good stuff. Once you say you don't like tea, you don't like them. But God wants us to inherit this land for him. For him. There is a revival coming. A revival that will see the sons and daughters of this nation serve God again. I was driving home last night. And I stopped over in Slough to buy something. I stopped at the shop. As I was walking out of my car, a boy came to me on the other side of the road, about maybe about 15, 16. And he knocked on my door. See? As if he wanted to tell me something. I thought maybe something was wrong with my tire or so. He, he was just he said, So I didn't open my, I, I didn't let down my, my glass. I came out of the car. I said, what is it? He said, I'm very hungry. I'm really starved. Can I have 95p? Just want to buy a, a pack of chips. Bef before you start feeling sorry, wait and listen to what I'm saying. Because you will not feel sorry for him, you feel sorry for yourself. I said 95. What do you want to buy? He said there is a shop that they sell chips. Cheap over there. I want to go and buy a pack. I said, okay, if that's what you like. I brought out a pound and gave to him. As I gave it to him, a police car came just that, at that same spot. He saw me hand over that one pound to him. And police guy just stopped. He said, hey, come here. You're asking for money, isn't it? You're asking for him to give you money. He didn't want to answer. He said, um, he, but you know you are not supposed to beg for money on the street of Slough. Don't you know that? He said, yes. So when I had the discussion, I, I walked towards there. He said, yes. He was asking you for money, isn't it? I said, yeah. He said he was hungry. Just wanted to. He said, no. Give the money back to him. And the guy truly took out the money and gave it to me and ran off. He said, sir, you done well. It's good. He gave to him. But he's not going to eat with it. He's going to fix himself with it. We know them. He's one of them. I know him very well. He's on drugs. He wasn't hungry. He was, okay, he wasn't hungry for food. He was hungry for something else. That is why you are here. I was going home last night, close to tears, thinking, if only I can see that boy again. If I made up my mind, I was going to be going there because I want to meet him again. But not just there. Do you know how many people that are around that boy in Slough that could have made a difference? Do you know how many people that are around me that I could have made a difference to that I don't think as though I'm, I care or I bother? And all is required of them or for them is for one of us to just help out. Brothers and sisters, that is why you are a king in a foreign land. That is why you were by the rivers of Babylon. That is why God allowed for us to leave the shore of our very beautiful nations 
where we all came from. Listen, if not for my assignment and the fact that I know that God wants me here, I love my cult, my country. In fact, you know what? I believe I will be a better pastor in my country. But God knows that this is where I'm needed. Are we going to fail God? Or are we going to allow God to use us? That is what I'm going to commit into your hands. We're going to talk about this some more. But I'm just using this as an opening to open up our hearts. To say, God, we will not be throwing pity party to ourselves. We will not love home so much that we lose track of what we're supposed to be doing in this land. We're not going to leave our suitcases half unpacked and just live in a narrow parochial mindset that we have built up over the years, not knowing what to do. He says, mind my business. And I pray that God will open up this more in your heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Unpack the suitcases. Why not just ask and say, God, I need you to really help me where this concerns me. Help me to make amends. Help me to set my mind. Help me to decide that I will live for you. Help me, oh God, to take the step of boldness and courage. Just like all those other missionaries came from here to the other part of the world and made landmark changes, landmark impacts. It is time for us when God has reversed the equation and brought us back into this country for revival's sake. In these dark ages, pray and ask that God help me not to fail you. We are on a mission for God. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We adore you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.